It's a privilege for me to return to the Wilsdon Seventh-day Adventist Church, a church that I have grown to love, a church that was responsible for molding me for the years that I served as pastor. I'm just so happy to hear the positive reports that I get from time to time. I want to thank the pastoral team there, especially your pastor, Dr. Mario Philip, for the good leadership he gives to this congregation. Thank you for extending the invitation for me to come and to share God's word this morning. I want to turn your attention to the passage in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to read verses 35 through 39. Hebrews chapter 10 and reading verses 35 to 39. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. I will invite you to follow in whatever translation you have. The Bible says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Over the past few months, many of us have been touched with death, whether it's a close relative or a distant relative. We have heard throughout the pandemic of thousands of lives being lost as a result of the COVID-19 virus. As pastors, we have conducted several funeral services we have had to counsel many families who have lost loved ones. And because of the lockdown restrictions, it's become very difficult to minister to those who are bereaved during this time. We are unable to hug them or put our arms around them to comfort them as we cry together over the loss of loved ones. I myself have recently experienced a bereavement in our own family when we lost our youngest brother. So I know what the pain of death feels like. In the passage of scripture that we have read, there is an interesting and an encouraging promise that I want us to hold on to. So I've entitled the presentation, Don't Lose Hope in God. Don't Lose Hope in God. Uh, the book of Hebrews was written to a group of believers who knew by experience what it means to lose loved ones. The book, the book of Hebrews was written to uh, believers who had undergone and suffered loss for the sake 
of Jesus Christ. They had experienced bereavement, and so often life's leftovers. When we have gone through that time of losing a loved one, and we look at what we have left, life's leftovers do not erase the pain of the loss that we have experienced, but they remind us that God has not left us empty-handed. And so, as these dispirited Christians looked upon their misfortunes that they had experienced in their lives, there was a temptation to become angry with God. There was this inclination to become somewhat confused and to give up on God. The spiritual profile of the readers of the book of Hebrews seems remarkably contemporary. These Christian believers had followed Jesus and the teachings that Jesus shared. These Christians had suffered abuse and affliction. They even suffered the loss of property for the sake of Christ. Now some of them had grown weary in the Christian walk. Some of them were drifting away. Others were tempted to unbelief. Still others had grown weary as Christians. Some even publicly denounced their faith. Whilst those who gradually stopped coming to church, perhaps they felt let down by God. Perhaps they felt that the trials was just too much. Perhaps when they cried out to God, God did not come through as they had expected. Others who were waiting on God didn't see the results that they had hoped and were now experiencing. Let me be honest with you. There are times that I myself have felt that pain. There are times that I myself feel that my prayers have not gone beyond the proverbial ceiling. There are questions that I have wrestled with God in recent times when I suffered my bereavement. I have wrestled with God. Why, God? Where were you, God? How did this happen? In his book, The Road Less Traveled, M. Scott Peck wrote these words in the very first paragraph. He says, life is difficult. Now that's a lesson that many of us have to learn. Whilst the most popular preachers today would remind us that following Christ, there is an abundant blessings, and they preach what we call the prosperity gospel, they very often forget to add that life is difficult. When a woman gives birth to a child with a disability, Friends, no sermon or book will ever remove that pain because life is difficult. Poverty and injustice will never go away in spite of all the best programs that government may put out. Life is difficult. In our marriages, we can work hard in our marriages. Sometimes they still end up in divorce. Life is difficult. 
you may be a non-smoking vegetarian Christian and you might still end up with cancer. Life is difficult. You may watch your health and pay strict attention to the laws of health and you might still catch COVID-19. Life is difficult. In fact, it has been said that being a human being is simply hazardous to one's health. Life is difficult. Sometimes Christians do lose their jobs. Even though they may work hard at it, life is difficult. Sometimes you might work hard and do your best at your places of employment and you might still be overlooked for that promotion. Life is difficult. Sometimes you study hard and prepare for an exam and the questions that come up in the examinations are not what you had studied. You might still miss that grade. Life is difficult. Like some of you, I used to believe that being a Christian somewhat inoculated me from getting problems in life. I used to think that being a Christian answered all life's questions and ultimately would make life easy. But I have since learned that sometimes being a Christian, our faith sometimes complicates life in ways that I cannot always understand. As a Christian, we seek to follow the teachings of Christ. And as we seek to live godly lives, it seems as though the enemy redoubles his effort and dogs our every footsteps because life is difficult. And this is what the preacher of the book of Hebrews is addressing. And he begins in this very text that we use for our scripture reading, he begins by calling us to remember our spiritual roots. Unfortunately, my friends, too many of us, when we have experienced difficulty in life, too many of us have tended to drift away from the faith. The text says in Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. When we are faced with multiple difficulties, we have the proclivity to want to give up. And this often is the case when we devalue the work of Christ in our lives. To throw it all away carries the idea that our spiritual heritage has become worthless. Don't cast away your faith. Paul, if you believe he is the author of the book of Hebrews, is saying, do not cast away your faith. The only things that we discard are things that we no longer hold as valuable. So when we consider what Jesus has done for us on Calvary, when we count it as worthless, we throw away our salvation, we throw away our faith simply because God hasn't come through for us in the way that we expected him to come through. When God hasn't manifested himself to us, when God hasn't answered the prayers that we have brought before him, there is this danger to want to throw in the towel. 
I wonder if you've ever asked the question, where is God in my predicament? I wonder whether you have also experienced the pain of loss and struggled with God, asking God, and still cannot hear from him. Why did God allow my child to die? How could God permit something, allow something like this to happen to our family? Where, I, where is God when I'm experiencing these difficult and most challenging moments of my life? All these questions, my friends, are very real to many of us. And when God does not perform according to my standard, when God doesn't come through when I want him to come through, then we ask the question, why should I continue to hold on to my faith? Why should I continue to hold on to God? Well, my friends, the answer lies in the very question we ask. We should hold on and stay with God because God has stayed and continues to stay with us. This is why, my friends, our spiritual roots are so important in this Christian journey. Ellen White puts it this way. She writes, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget the way the Lord has led us in times past. Yes, my friends, spiritual roots are important where God has brought us from in our Christian journey is important to where we are going. As a matter of fact, when we consider our spiritual journey with God and the importance of that spiritual journey, I am reminded of that um, wonderful book which was um, played out in a television series by Alex Haley called Roots. Some of you will remember that series where Alex Haley traces his family history to the soils of West Africa to a clansman by the name of Kunta Kinti. After being carried away from his native land to an alien country, the young Kunta could not reconcile being shackled in chains. And as a protest, he would run away from his new slave master and the inhumane lifestyle that was forced upon him. Some individuals from his homeland, had accepted the lifestyle of a slave, but the act of escape became a constant behavior for this young African. Developing in his mind was something better than what he was experiencing on the plantation. One day, Kunta ran away from the plantation. He was pursued and caught, chained, brought back, and he was hoisted in the air for a public flogging. His shirt was ripped, exposing his naked back, and he was whipped publicly. This torturous act was not just for the runaway slave only, but was for all other slaves with similar intentions to escape. The sound of the whip lashing his back was painful enough, but to add insult to injury, the slave owner demanded that he give up his name. And so each time the whip would cut into Kunta's back, the slave owner would say, your name is Toby. 
And each time the young African would, re would respond, my name is Kunta. In defiance, this went on for what seemed an eternity. Your name is Toby. No, my name is Kunta Kinte. Each strike was more painful than the first, but he still would not give up his name. This ordeal was too unbearable for his mother and siblings to watch. And finally, Kunta collapsed under the pressure of a brutal beating. But he whispered defiantly, My name is Kunta Kinte. For Kunta to have surrendered his name would have been given up his identity. For Kunta to have given up his name would have meant turning his back on the teachings of his ancestors. For Kunta to have acquiesced would have mean to say, my history is worthless. To recant his name would have been worse than death. His name was all he had to connect him to his past. His name was his passport to freedom. And because Kunta held on to his name, Alex Haley, hundreds of years afterwards, was able to locate the origin of his ancestors. My brothers and my sisters, our faith is invaluable. Our very name, Seventh-day Adventists, was given by God himself. Our name, Adventists, serves as a constant rebuke to the Christian world. When we began as a movement, there were many names that were put forward. But when the name Seventh-day Adventist was professed, Ellen White says, in vision, she acknowledged that this was the name that God wanted for his final day movement. And so, my friends, we also have a name. We are called Seventh-day Adventists because we still believe that the seventh day is still the Sabbath of the Lord our God. We are called Seventh-day Adventists because we still believe in the imminent advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our name is valuable. We have spiritual roots. We have experienced the bittersweet experience of Revelation chapter 10. God has given us a message to this dying world. We are Adventists whilst the majority of Protestantism have rejected the Bible truth of the Ten Commandments. Adventists still uphold the law of God as being the transcript of God's character. We have spiritual roots. We cannot give up our name. Our name is significant. So when Paul says in Hebrews chapter 10, don't give away your faith or don't throw away your faith, I submit to us today, we have a rich history. We have spiritual roots that we cannot, we dare not throw away. I told some of my members before in times past that you belong to a great family. Yes, we have millions of Seventh-day Adventists scattered all over the globe, but we belong to a wider family. What do I mean? Well, let me tell you. Adam and Eve, our first parents, were Adventists. When we 
sin, re, re, read about sin in the book of Genesis. The Bible tells us that when God came and sought after Adam, Adam, where are you? You remember the discussion that took place? Because we were naked, we hid ourselves. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of that forbidden tree that I said you should stay away from? And you know how the story unfolds. And when God now stands and speaks to Adam and Eve and to Satan on the, uh, on the other hand, God says that the seed of the woman would one day come and will bruise the head of the serpent. That day, Adam and Eve had the hope that one day the seed of the woman, which is Christ himself, one day the seed of the woman would come to redeem the human family. From that moment, Adam and Eve became Adventists because they were looking forward to the first advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yes, my friends, you belong to a wider family of God. I can assure you also that Abraham was an Adventist. When God spoke to Abraham and says, Abraham, come and look into the heavens and see if you can count how many stars there are. And he says, so shall your seed be. It is going to be through your seed that all nations would be blessed. Abraham became an Adventist. He was looking forward to the first advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, when he was ministering on earth, he was able to stand before the priests and the rulers and say to them, Abraham desired to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And those Religious leaders couldn't understand, but they tried to ridicule Jesus by saying, well, you're not even 50 years old, and have you seen our father Abraham? Oh yes, Abraham desired to see the day of Jesus' ministry, and Jesus says he saw it and was glad. Abraham was an Adventist. He was looking forward to the advent of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jacob was an Adventist. The Bible tells us that when Jacob was now advanced in age, the old patriarch lay on his deathbed and he called for his 12 sons to come before him. And as his sons came before him, the spirit of prophecy descended upon Jacob. And Jacob was now able to look each of his sons in the face and with prophetic tones begin to prophesy or to predict the future of each of his 12 sons. When he came to Judah, he said to Judah, Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes and unto him shall be the gathering of the people. Yes, Jacob knew that the Messiah would come through the line of Judah. Jacob, beloved, was an Adventist. He looked forward to the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moses was an Adventist. Under the inspiration of God, Moses wrote, The Lord will raise up a prophet from among the brethren like unto thee. And my words, God says, will be in his mouth. He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Isaiah was an Adventist. 
In chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah, you know it well. Isaiah is so overwhelmed by the coming of the Messiah that he says, Who has believed our report? And to whom of the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up as a root out of a dry ground. You know Isaiah chapter 53, describing the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. Isaiah looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. Yes, Isaiah was an Adventist. You belong to a much wider family of God. You and I are Seventh-day Adventists. We have experienced the bittersweet experience of Revelation chapter 10. So hold on to your name. Don't throw away your faith. You will have a great reward. And you might ask the question, when? Then the author of the book of Hebrews says, For yet in a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. And so the author is telling us, yes, we may have experienced bereavement. Yes, we may have experienced some disappointments in this Christian journey, but don't give up. Don't throw away your faith. Hold on to God. Because in a little while, he that shall come, that's Jesus Christ, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Yes, beloved, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We believe Jesus is coming again soon. In fact, his coming is imminent. The signs all around about us tell us that he is even at the doors. We know that this world as it exists today cannot continue much longer. Jesus is soon to come. And the text goes on to say that he is coming to reward us. Paul tells us, He that shall come will come and will not tarry. And he has a reward to give to each one of us. What is this reward, Paul? Well, Paul says, there was a time that I was caught up into the third heavens. The things that I saw, oh, how I wish I could speak the language of heaven. But Paul described it this way. He says, I has not seen nor has ear heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Paul would, could not describe the things that he saw. And so today, I plead with you, if you are going through difficulties, if you have experienced bereavement, if there is a temptation to give up on God, like the people who this letter was written to, I say to you, hold on to God. Don't cast away your faith, because in a little while, he that is to come will come and will not tarry. Not only is he coming to give us the reward of eternal life? But he has gone to prepare a place for us where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more suffering, where there will be no more COVID-19, where there will be no more restrictions, no more pandemic, where there will be no more death. And John says, he saw that new place. He said he describes it as the new Jerusalem that comes out of God. He says God himself will wipe away all tears from our eyes. It's over, my friends. The pains that we have experienced is over. The affliction shall not arise the second time. God himself will be with us. 
the Bible says, we shall see the face of God. What a day that's going to be. And so my admonition to you and to me is, let us hold on to our faith. Let us not cast away our faith. Don't give up on God. God is faithful. Soon and very soon, God is going to make his appearance. God is going to put an end to all the pain and suffering. God is going to reward us. That's the hope that we have. It's called the blessed hope. Now is not the time to give up on God. Let us hold on to God. Will you pray with me? Father, I just thank you for the promises in your sacred word. I thank you that it won't be long that Jesus will come again. It won't be long what we are experiencing will be a thing of the past. Until then, Father, keep us faithful. Until then, comfort us as we go through these difficult times. Until then, save us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.